In the grim darkness of the future, there are many tales of heroism, of defiance against all odds, of nations and peoples who have clung to existence by dint of their courage and tenacity alone, when all have sought their destruction, of fiends and villains, of wickedness and malice, of horror and strife. But ever have the most heinous and compelling been the stories of jealousy, greed, and the treachery from which they spring. Brother slaying brother, sister slaying daughter. Yet in all of the annals of the grim darkness of the future, there are few that display the cold, callous reality of those terrible times more than this dark song. For if the Emperor could shed a tear for each great treachery, each time his will has been suborned, his bright and glorious design for humanity's safety and prosperity gone awry, then surely one of the bitterest tears would be for this tragedy. Welcome, gentle listener, as the League of Law present for your delectation one of the most lamentable of ballads. Welcome to the history of the planet and people called Krieg. In the Imperium of Mankind, the Empire which spans the Milky Way galaxy of the grim darkness of the future, which is said to contain a million worlds, there were few that could match the planet of Krieg. A hive world with towering megacities that caressed the skies, each with subterranean vaults that bore deep into the ground. But outside of these sprawling hubs, the skies were blue, the fields were green, Beneath the ground lay rich deposits of minerals and metals aplenty. Above it, in orbit, the world was encircled by satellites for its defense, ports for its many commercial ventures, a mercantile world at the very heart of its region of space. A world of wealth and plenty, almost unheard of elsewhere in the Imperium. Alas, for with their growing affluence, prestige and power, came the slow creep of the greatest of rots, the most cardinal of sins, pride. The world's teeming citadels were each ruled by a single family, often a single man or woman. And as is universally known, pride goeth before the fall. For the ruling elite became enamored of their power, jealous of their wealth and prestige, and slipped along the pathway towards isolationism, petty grudges, Machiavellian courtly intrigues. They built their defenses, forging nigh on impregnable bastilles of their hives, and begrudging the resources that were ties to the Imperium. They never saw that their prosperity was bought by the sacrifice of others, that due to them never seeing the horrors which the Imperium's armies fought, they could not encompass their place within the whole. The dire need for the interior of the Imperium to support the never-ending wars fought on its fringes. And so, we visit the birthplace of the crime, where it all begins. The scene, a palace of astonishing opulence, at the top of the highest of spires, in the largest of the hives. The home of the chairman of the Council of Autocrats, the ruling body of Krieg. Three of the world's most powerful men, the Autarchs, sit around a table of marble and gold filigree, supping on Amasek of a rare, powerful vintage. And thus, they sow the seeds of the future. So, here we sit again, counting the cost of a tyranny that takes and takes, but gives us nothing. Hear, hear, Chairman. They are like unto a leech that grows fat on our lifeblood. 
This is not a conversation we should be having, Chairman. The Imperium is not known for its clemency to those who break faith with it. You lack a spine, Turgenev, and perspective. Your hive is almost paltry compared to ours. You do not see the vast shipments of our toil lifted into the skies and onward to an entity that gives us nothing while sapping our strength. And for what? Protection? Ha! It's a racket. They are like hoodlums who offer to protect while hiding behind a threat of punishment if we do not pay them. Like the lowest hiver gangs. Perhaps your defences are high enough that you can survive an orbital bombardment from the fleet, the navy. We are not all in that position. Have you considered that your lack of defences may well be caused by the very tithes to the Imperium? How much could you bolster your bulwarks if you were free of this oppressive yoke? If the wealth you generated were not stolen? Oh, I agree, but the Emperor commands it. We are all human, no? Can you actually see them lifting a finger if we were beset by Xenos? Can you? We pay them for nothing. Nor is it the Emperor's will. It is the gaggle of greedy nothings that sit on the High Council of Terror. There is probably no Emperor at all. A fairy tale to gain compliance. A fiction used to force us to our knees. I must agree, Belikov. I have dealt with these delegates of the administratum, the ministorum. Nothing but petty bureaucrats. But also, you lack perspective, Turgenev. The Imperium's fleet and vengeance is a bogeyman. It is not real. If they are beset on all sides, as they claim, and used to justify our tithes, then they have not the resources to bring us to heel. If they are not beset, then their fleet, their armies, are not as all-consuming and all-pervasive as we are told. A hollow threat. And our hives have their defences, our orbital arrays, our macro cannons. Any fleet would be torn to shreds before it reached orbit, and when there we would annihilate them. The truth is that no matter the reality... If they are actually fighting wars, or if they are lying, they will not have the power to take Krieg. We really are beyond their ability to bring to heel, if we but throw off the shackles of their propaganda. All you have to do, Turgenev, is believe in Krieg more than you fear the spectre of the Imperium. I will mull it over. Don't take too long, Turgenev. We are almost ready. The Feast of the Ascension is only a month away. Because in this fight, I tell you straight, you are either with us or against us. Now, now, Belikov, we are all friends here. I'm sure Turgenev will come to his own decision. And that decision will be the right one. Just give me more time... I see the merit of your plan. I am just concerned for my holdings. I will bid you farewell. I have matters to which to attend and things to set in motion if my hive is to be prepared. Chairman Belikov. As Archon Turgenev rises from his seat and politely nods to his colleagues and leaves, the remaining two hunch over or conspiratorially. I don't think he will draw up the gumption. Spineless. It's a large step for a worm like Turgenev, but he will come around. Our forces are being quietly moved into position. When you give the word, Chairman, we will fall on these loyalist elements of the Guard from all angles. I have already made sure that their resupplies are being delayed. All goes to plan. Then, soon it is time to initiate Phase 1, Martial Law. We can then remove any obstacles. If Turgenev makes any moves to inform the Guard, 
the rats amongst our land, then we can use the emergency executive powers to remove him. We can also justify the open movement of our men. If we do this right, Belikov, it will be over in days. Oh, we will. All is going to plan, as I said. To your house, Chairman. You will go down in history as the greatest of men of Krieg. The Liberator. The Liberator. I like the sound of that. The two men smugly smile at each other while raising their crystal glasses to toast each other's success. And thus, the die is cast. Over the coming months, subtly, quietly, the forces of Krieg were redeployed, like spiders forming a web. They controlled every junction, every transit system between the hives. They poised to strike. They made sure not to show their hand. All of the council were as one. Only Turgenev vacillated. Only he. But then, none of the others had Colonel Jurten sharing their hive. The commander of the Imperial Guard stationed on Krieg, Colonel Jurden was not a man to be trifled with, and certainly not by the likes of Archon Turgenev. When they were almost ready, their plot about to hatch, they set the board with their penultimate move. All across each hive on the entirety of Krieg, the word went out. The chairman of the Council of Autocrats was to make a declaration, a rarity to be sure. None could actually remember the last time one had been made. Something was in the offing. Something big. And so, the billions of citizens of the hive worlds of Krieg, from highest to lowest, gathered in preparation for this address, this unusual announcement. All silenced as a screen struck into life, and the majestic figure of the chairman appeared before their eyes. My fellow loyal citizens of Krieg, it is with a heavy heart that I must disclose to you that there are vipers amongst our number, wolves amongst our flock. We, the Council of Autocrats, your leaders, your shepherds, your defenders, your lords, we have kept from you the rise of these vermin. I knew that it would break your hearts to know that some have turned their backs on our great nation, that they conspire to destroy our way of life, to destroy our harmony. But now, I can hide this no longer. For the protection of all, every hive, every citizen, I must declare martial law. Rest assured, that the instant we have rooted out the scum, the moment we have cleaned house, this emergency action will end. But for now, we will do what needs to be done for the greater glory of Krieg! In the command centre of the Imperial Guard forces of Krieg, in the hive of Ferrograd, the message did not go untallied or unnoticed. Colonel Yurton and his aide, Denisov, watched on as the chairman finished his speech to the adulation of the crowds. The screen died. The colonel did not change his stance, did not look away. He stood transfixed, lost in the deepest of contemplations before he finally spoke. There's something amiss here. Have we any sightings at all of any of these insurgents? Not a peep. Must be being dealt with at the local level. Hmm. I don't like it. Recall all of our men out on furlough. It might raise an eyebrow or two. Ha! <laughs> Turgenev wouldn't notice an orc infestation right under his very nose. Just do it. Yes, sir. What the hell are you up to, Chairman? As the forces of Krieg now had carte blanche to reposition, thus they did, 
Huge formations of infantry and armor crisscrossed the landscape of Krieg, ever confusing to the guard who could discern no actual threat, no insurgent forces, no war. Jurten waited, but warily. Something was definitely amiss. Of course, his warrior sensed the itching between his shoulder blades, the feeling of being stalked. It was right. At dusk, only days before the celebration of the Emperor's ascension, they struck. All of the movement, all of the repositioning had been to one end, to one goal, the encirclement of the loyalist elements of the Guard. When the armies of the Council of Autocrats struck, it struck hard. Their supplies bled by the machinations of the Council, taken completely unawares, the Guard was slaughtered. Formation after formation was fallen upon by well-coordinated attacks. Heavy fire from the hives themselves, when all those within the realms of the traitors' cities were rounded up and executed on the spot. It was plain and simple butchery. Casualty reports came flooding into the command center at Ferrograd. Almost immediately, Colonel Yurton took decisive action. He knew the Autark of Ferrograd to be a weakling, so to be sure, he paid him a visit. The guards of the palace at the top of the spire of Ferrograd moved aside with alacrity as the battle-hardened and dour-countenanced men of the Imperial Guard flanked their colonel. None stopped them as his entourage threw back the doors to the audience chamber where Turgenev sat, his menial scattering before the thunderhead that was the delegation of guard. Colonel Yurden did not miss a step as he marched directly to the foot and then up the stairs, up to Turgenev, who now sat bolt upright on his throne-like chair at its summit. He looked directly into the eyes of the palace fop. What is the meaning of this? Barging in here like this, what has gotten into you, Yurton? I am going to ask you one question. Did you know about this? Uh, about what? The lips flap, the arms gesture, but the eyes say it all. Goodbye, you simpering traitor. No, no! We have secured the hive. The message has gone out, sir. Remaining loyalist forces are heading here at maximum speed. Those that are left. The hive secured, the remaining loyalist forces fled to Ferrograd, all the while harried and punished by the armies of the treacherous council. Trapped in the one hive with a fraction of their forces, the result seemed to be inevitable. Krieg would declare its independence, would cease to be a part of the Imperium, and there was little Colonel Yurton or any of the loyalists could do to prevent it, or so it seemed. Yurton made one last desperate plea to the Greater Imperium, alerting them of the events on Krieg and raising a call for assistance. But the calculations of the Council of Autocrats was correct. The Ministorum ad Administratum weighed the costs. On the one hand, Krieg was wealthy and had rich deposits of minerals, a vast industry, a gem without measure. But on the other hand, there were the layered defenses, the orbital platforms, the powerful cannons that they had installed that could bleed any fleet in orbit and bleed them badly. The calculations were swift and simple, the result foregone. Krieg would take an entire fleet and hordes of troops and entire columns of armor and artillery to retake, and in the doing, they would ruin the very resources they were seemingly fighting over. The risk simply did not meet the tally of reward. Alas, this is where the avaricious lords of Krieg had made a fundamental error. They had underestimated the Imperium, and they had underestimated Jurten's will. Communication came back. It was simple in its wording, but the ramifications, oh, the dire ramifications of that one missive, for it gave the location of a hidden bunker in Ferrograd. One not even its residents knew. The missive went on to order Yurton and all loyalist forces to resist the traitors, to punish them, and to attempt to return to the Imperium. At any cost. Any. The last part of the missive. Well...
The bunker's thick bass doors screeched into life for the first time in what must have been millennia, perhaps more. Rust and detritus were thick in the air, the lights inside slowly flickering on. At first, all Colonel Yerton could see were grid metal walkways, but as the illuminators gained power, the contents of this hidden treasure trove hove into vision. Even Yerton was awed by what he beheld. The Magos of the Mechanicum, who walked into the massive area with him, scratched the ground with its metal legs and created an eerie echo as the clicks and whirs of his mechanical body resounded around the cavernous expanse. Are these what I think they are? These are the weapons of the Dark Age, my lord. How many? What range? What can I expect from them? Enough to destroy your enemies, to bring them to their knees, anywhere in this globe. Enough to transform this world forever. And you can launch them at the targets I wish, when I wish. Yes, this can be done. Good, prepare them. The Feast of the Ascension approaches. We shall give these traitors his regards. The day of the Feast of the Emperor's Ascension dawned. A day that would go down in Krieg's history, but not in the way that the rebels had imagined. The massed forces of the Council tore down the defensive hard points of Ferragrad with concentrated fire. Their best shock troops rampaged through the breaches created, but they found no resistance. They found no infantry manning barricades, no snipers hunting their officers, nothing. The streets and alleyways of Ferragrad were like a ghost town. Nothing moved, nothing. As they penetrated further into the city, their endless march utterly unopposed, a growing foreboding permeated them all. Where was Jurtn and his guard? Where? When they reached the inner segments to find all the access points into the underhives, into the very center of the metropolis as well, all had been welded closed. As the sun approached its zenith, a rumbling began to build beneath them. It was as if the outer rings of the hive were about to collapse in on themselves. Huge doors then opened, and the massed rebels encompassed their doom. Hundreds of missiles as one fired into the skies, burning many to a crisp with their discharge. Those rebels that remained knew. One glimpse of them and they knew. They were dead. Each of the missiles had separate targets, each different payloads, different intent. Over the course of the next few hours, nuclear missiles slammed into each of the hives across the entire globe. Some touted powerful defensive shielding, many did not. But in any case, the fallout did its damage. As this happened, many of the missiles exploded in the upper atmosphere, causing radiation to rain down over the entire world. Others of these weapons of annihilation from the dark age of technology were designed to create a firestorm that whipped around the entire planet, burning every inch of its open expanses, its verdant fields, its rich orchards, vaporizing its seas claiming every single last living thing outside of the Hive cities, and many inside. For the rebels were utterly unprepared for the devastation that had been unleashed by Yurton. Krieg burned. But even when the fires finally burnt out, there was no escape, no respite. For the sun was clouded by masses of detritus thrown into the upper atmosphere, and a nuclear winter ensued. Krieg froze. On the day of the Emperor's ascension, through the actions of Jurten and his Magos accomplice, the rebels felt the full wrath of the God Emperor, and billions of lives were snuffed out. Then billions more froze, or their skin slipped off them and their hair dropped out in clumps, 
Their eyes were made sightless, and their teeth were left in any food that they attempted to consume. Death was set loose to stalk the land, unfettered and insatiable. Krieg was destroyed. And so the war began in earnest. The nuclear, chemical and biological carnage unleashed by Yurton, even the odds. So high a toll had it reaped. The forces of the rebels were reeling their beautiful cities, their lush land, mostly destroyed. All were forced into a subterranean existence, like too many rats in a cage too small. Never would they be caught or asked nor given. To the rebels, the Imperial Guard under Yurton were the worst of all war criminals. They had butchered billions, had performed the ultimate crime of bringing Krieg low, destroying its people, its lands, its seas, its skies, all for the love of a fictional character somewhere far distant in the darkest reaches of space. They had killed Krieg for millennia, if not longer. They were the most vile of fiends. To the loyalists, the rebels had turned their back on the God Emperor, the Imperium and all of humanity out of the basis of motivations. Greed. They had damned every soul on Krieg for nothing more than wealth. And damned is the correct word in all its connotations. The loyalists were ardent adherents to the Imperial Creed. They loved and worshipped their God the master of mankind, the emperor. To them all of Krieg, every man, woman and child had been denied the heaven of a place at his side. So it was a holy war on one side and a war of vengeance on the other. But as time went on, the entire culture of Krieg became more twisted, more hateful. There was simply no time to heal, to forgive, to forget. Never is there a more bloody conflict than that of civil war. For true rage comes not from the adversary, the alien, the Xenos, the other. True rage comes from the knife in the back. The brother betrayed. And both sides believed that they had been betrayed in the most horrific way. As the war was without end, the battles without compare in their spite, the tactics deployed the most callous, the most vengeful, the body counts, the most eye-watering in all of the Imperium, it could be said. And it was human killing human, brother killing brother. The existence of the people of Krieg swiftly descended into a level of barbarity, a level of brutality that cannot truly be described. The weak, those who could not take part, those with deformities, those with frailties, all were despised on both sides, as they could not contribute to the war effort. Thus did the cult of sacrifice grow in its potency with each passing bitter year of the conflict. True sons and daughters of humanity, sons and daughters of the Emperor, weep for the sins of Krieg. Weep for our betrayal of the Emperor. Weep that you have but one life to give, for there is nothing we can give, nothing we can do to atone for the sins of Krieg. Yet to not even try would be the greater sin. Another sin against the Emperor. Sacrifice, for it is the only way to honor the Emperor we betrayed. Sacrifice all you have, all you are, all you will ever be. For we are nothing in his eyes until we atone. For the Emperor! All were indoctrinated from their very first breath. All. The feeling of being damned, of desperately needing to gain forgiveness from their god Emperor Rose. As the death toll mounted, it seeped into the very subconscious of the people of Krieg. No sacrifice would ever be too much. Many would say that this was madness. This is madness. But in my reading of the law, from my perspective alone, this made perfect sense. The loyalists of Krieg believed that they had to redeem themselves in the eyes of their god. 
So if they could just fight hard enough, sacrifice enough, prove themselves worthy of redemption, they could regain the love of the Emperor. Then every single soul lost, every human who had been lost in this war without end, could be redeemed. If they could not, if the Emperor always turned his head from them, then every single life lost, every single privation, every suffering, every sacrifice was for naught. Each battalion, each regiment, each warrior of Krieg was brought up to believe that if they could just fight hard enough, then maybe, just maybe, their effort would be the one that brought salvation to all of the men, women and children of Krieg that had fallen. It redeemed them all. Such fervor was almost impossible to stop, but was met with the hatred of the rebels of Krieg, who blamed it all on the loyalists. Battles were hard to describe, but I shall try. The skies were blighted, the very soil irradiated, so out from their hives, out from their protections, the armies of both would emerge. Their lines drawn up, and then the engagements were ferocious, because they only had a limited time to make gains. No human could survive on the surface for long, even in protective gear. So the battles were not nuanced gambits of thrust and counter, positioning and perfection. No. They were headlong charges into the ranks of the enemy, a desperation to take ground in a short period of time before the klaxons and whistles ordered their withdrawal. And if substantial gains had not been made, then all who died, all of the millions of men left on that battlefield, were wasted for nothing. And this went on for five hundred years. First rank ready. Charge! First rank ready! Charge! Front rank ready! Charge! Fix bayonets! Charge! For the Emperor! First rank, ready! Charge! Each year, the callouses and the callousness grew. When generals of ability on either side arose, their faction would make gains. When they succumbed to death of age or poisoning from merely existing on Krieg, they could be replaced with less experienced or able warlords. Thus the tides of battle went one way, then the other by the generation. The forces of the Royalists slowly by slowly taking one hive after another, but the ancient defences made in the Halcyon days before that dreaded moment of ascension, before the nuclear attack, were still in place. The losses in taking the most powerful hives were catastrophic for the Royalists, sometimes leaving them so denuded of men that they could be retaken again within weeks, covered in the hordes of the rebels. It swung one way, then the other, Never-ending carnage, never-ending charges, never-ending bloodshed. And yes, I am being repetitive in my linguistic style, to show you the grinding nature of the conflict, to show how the wheel turned, always crushing billions of lives under its tracks throughout the ages. Krieg developed astonishingly efficient ways of generating, reclaiming and retooling their resources. They became a beast with but one goal, the manufacture of weapons of war, both material and personnel. The training regimes alone were barbaric. Live ammunition used in every exercise. Life could not be cheaper. With the goal of a universal redemption for not only every soul on Krieg, but everyone that had existed and been lost in those years, no sacrifice was deemed too high. None. And all of the things that make humans what they are was lost, thrown onto the pyre of war. No culture, no art, no love, no poetry, no dance, no music, no relaxation, no standard of life whatsoever. The promise of Krieg was gone, replaced by a monster that sought only war. Finally, after five hundred years of conflict, finally, the Loyalists took the last hive. Krieg was one again, unified in the worship of the Emperor, the need to serve him. Even regaining dominance of the entire world was not enough, however. They could never be forgiven for the treachery and betrayal of a now mythical evil, 
the Council of Autocrats. But they were one, and ready at long last to rejoin the Imperium. So they could fight amongst the stars in the Emperor's name. So they could continue to seek a redemption in the only way they knew how. War and sacrifice. An administratum menial, hunched in gait, debasing himself in his very stance, entered the room of his direct superior. He hovered unmoving, his eyes down, bent in a half-bow, awaiting the attention of his coordinator. Get to the point, or I will have a new servitor by the end of the week. Spit it out. The menial did not raise his head or his eyes as he said. It is from Craig. Where? It is a world that has not been in contact for near five hundred years. We had written it off, but they are now back. Ah, let's see what they want. Then we file it. Probably another cry for help. Why these backwater holes believe we have time for them? The Emperor alone knows. They say they stand ready to rejoin the Imperium. They offer men, soldiers. The menial took a few halting steps forward to reverently place the document on the desk before his master. Interesting. Send it up the chain. A message had been sent to the Munitorum, who had considered it, and then officials in both Departmento had agreed Krieg was a hellhole. All knew that. Thus one regiment was to be requested of them. Just one. A trial to see if they could provide anything of worth to the wider Imperium, for it was well known that the world was blasted death world. Gone was its splendor, and thus its use. Within days, the same menial returned to his master's office. We have a response from Krieg. The coordinator did not look up from his cogitator, just beckoned with his hand. The menial approached and laid the document in front of him. When the coordinator's eyes finally took in the document, the surprise was palpable. They say they have twenty regiments ready and armed. It gets more interesting as well, sir. They said what? Twenty regiments requesting the most difficult war zones. They're either lunatics or deluded. Ah, send it to the Departamento Munitorum. Let's see what they think of this madness. A dispatch was sent to the Munitorum immediately. The response from the Munitorum was tepid at first. Excitement at the resources, if not astonishment. But many made bold claims, and many failed in these claims. Krieg. Well, they make all the right noises. Let's see if they can actually perform. They're either lunatics or delusional. They request hell? We have plenty of that. Prepare dispatch orders. And thus the twenty regiments, fully armed and equipped from Krieg, were deployed, as they had requested, to the most hellish war zones within transit ranges. The speed of their recruitment, the ability to raise, train and equip their own men, and in such numbers, was not to be underestimated. But the proof of the pudding, as they say, is always in the tasting. So in a rare move, the field commanders of the forces of those wars in which they had fought were contacted and collected. A candid discussion needed to be had. With four generals in the room, the Amasek flowed freely and went down well. Finally, the question all awaited was posed. So, you have all had victories in what were previously deadlocked situations. I have no doubt it was your brilliance that achieved these results, generals. But what of the new regiments, the men of Krieg? What say you, General Valrak? Yes, they can fight. Like madmen, they can fight. Krieg will be a worthy addition to the armies of the Imperium. General Gersh, General Alchemist. Krieg, they do the job, but they aren't what you'd call standard. They don't play well with others. I agree. They cause far too much trouble when deployed alongside other regiments. But the results are there. They are lethal, 
insane almost. But if managed, they will serve the Emperor well. Hmm. I think if you're a kinder of gentleman. No. This Amasek isn't going to drink itself. Let us toast your victories. The victories of the Imperium. To the Emperor. At that, things changed on Krieg. The Munitorum and Administratum began the rerouting of resources, technical skills and transport to make Krieg the very heart of its region again. But this time, the only thing that came in were resources, and the only thing that left were regiments of men. Fanatical men. Men who would die for the Emperor without consideration, without restraint. And the Commissariat were shoehorned into the regiments. But unlike any other force, their remit was not to encourage the men of Krieg. It was to restrain them from throwing their lives away. Also, their secondary task was not to instill faith, as that Krieg had in such abundance that they oft outshone their, even their own commissars. But they were to coordinate with other forces in the field. For left to Krieg, they would tell all and sundry that they were weak, lacked faith, and were cowards. So the commissars were left to act as mediators between this most bellicose of all regiments and the militarum, the guard, and wide. But an obvious solution developed in the Munitorum. A very simple one, if Krieg could not work with others. Well... Stepping out of the chambers of the High Lords of Terror themselves, the Munitorum and Administorum officials walked at an excited pace down the hallowed corridors, and discuss the results. The High Council of Terror has passed judgment. Vitae wounds have been approved. At this rate, we'll be able to raise entire armies from Krieg. Such was the effectiveness of the Death Corps of Krieg. Such was their need to be placed as far from other warriors of the Imperium as possible that such drastic and intensely questionable measures were to be employed. But for the specifics of the Vitae wombs and their ramifications, perhaps you can find those details out in the entries by my colleagues. I'm sure one of them has covered it. And thus was the Death Corps of Krieg finally ratified. From Krieg will be raised and equipped entire armies to serve in the Emperor's name. But here is the rub, the ironic tragedy of it all. The Emperor, the master of mankind, the architect of the imperial truth, the Lord who crafted and then led the crusade to free all of his people, all of humanity from the yoke of tyranny. He would never have wanted this. And if he ever were to awaken, if the Emperor were ever to be healed and walk amongst his people again, he could crush the fighting spirit of the men and women of Krieg. He could eradicate hundreds of years of hate and pain and suffering with but three words. I forgive you. Well, I thought that went swimmingly. First time out. Get the other guys to do more lines next time. Well, wasn't much time. 
What do you think, Tiger? <laughs> Your powers are weak, old man. <sighs> How did I know you'd say that? Who <laughs> was the Edge Lord? Well, surprised everybody did it, though. Out of the blue. Only had the idea Wednesday morning. Pity some of the others didn't have time. Oh well. Next time. Suck it up, Boulders. You're a nightmare to work with. Yes, yes, I know. Oh well. Back in the teleport time for you, young man. You've got content to create tomorrow. What a mess. Hmm. We are definitely doing this at someone else's house next time. Definitely. Wasn't MK drinking with that mad genius? Love his stuff. So hard to do comedy. Never going to please everyone, though. Can I go to sleep now, honey? Oh, thank you. See you in about three days. Ah, bed. I am so tired. Greetings, Voldemort, guide to Warhammer. I have come to this your realm to inquire upon thine skull and ask you if you mind me asking something we all wish to know the answer to. <sighs> Hi, Alphabusa. Are you aware that you are Bald. Yes. Yes, I did. Uh, the slapping helped underline it, though. Uh, go on. Off to the sofa bed with you. And do me a favour. Stop drinking well, Valrak and M MK, will you? Come on. Thanks, that is all. Please have a good one, and thank you again. Third time this week. I've got to take his teleportarum keys off him. Right, bed. Ah, <sighs> not allowed near a computer for a week. Eh, weird. Oh well. Mm. Just hope everyone remembers to have fun. Toodaloo.